Hi everyone, welcome to Bond University's Now Talks. The Now Talks is a series of talks at the university to help you learn in the now and to discover new things about the amazing world we live in. My name is Jeff Brand. I'm Professor of Communication and Creative Media here at Bond University and I have the great fortune of delivering this, the second Now Talk. Today we're going to talk about the serious side of games and we're coming to you from the Level Up Lab down at Bond University's uh, lab precincts just underneath the library. Uh, what you see on the screen behind me is Bond University rendered in Minecraft a few years ago, a project that we did in one of our subjects. I have the great fortune of being supported by an amazing team and I just wanted to point out that at Bond University by involving Periscope and uh, creating a series of talks for the wider community, we are definitely helping everyone in the wider Australian and global community live in the now with important topics. So with that, let me get underway by just talking a little bit about the game of life. Uh, it's really interesting that uh, Johann Heisinger, a philosopher from the 1930s in a book, Homo Ludens, Man the Player, uh, we discovered that uh, there are so many ways to understand the role of games in our culture. And in fact, Heisinger said that games are central to culture, play, and um, exploring new avenues for engagement with one another is how we actually come together and learn about our limits and also to understand uh, who we are as a people and as, as a society. And so when we see references to play and when we see references to game in our culture, it's not surprising uh, that they come up in so many ways. For example, on the screen here I have the game of life, um, you know, the career game. Uh, the real estate game, something that's very topical just at the moment in Australia uh, as we move into very high priced property markets and a potential recession. Uh, we hear about the competition, uh, backing winners, and of course the idea that there are winners and losers in life. And so this has intrigued me greatly and I guess um, the, the thing that really disturbs me is that we don't take games, particularly computer games, terribly seriously. And as we'll see, and I hope we can just talk about today, uh, games, particularly computer games, are at the now of engineering, knowledge, and development in society. So I've put on the screen behind me a picture from the Bond University graduation ceremony. For a few years, we offered a Bachelor of Computer Games. Are there any guesses what happened uh, in the audience when the reader announced, and for the degree, Bachelor of Computer Games, and then rattled off a number of names, what the audience did? Of course, you heard these rumbles and sort of you know, whispers, and how could that possibly be the case when Bachelor of Film and Television was fine? Bachelor of Journalism, of course, highly respectable. Uh, I, suspe I suspect if we had a Bachelor of Golf Management, and we do have Sports Management, so not far away, that would have even been more respectable. But Computer Games is just out there. And so, of course, we changed the name of the degree to Interactive Media and Design because we felt that it was um, maybe too now, if you know what I mean. It was just a little bit too current and people weren't really ready for it. And so it was, uh, in some ways, at graduations I felt it was Mario versus the future. I thought I could see the future and I thought I could see that video games and computer games were absolutely central to everything uh, that is coming in the digital economy. But this guy behind me uh, was dominating the way people were thinking about this medium. They weren't really taking it seriously. So. Um, what happens in this case is that the people in the audience who can't see the train coming down the tracks, uh, and it's a virtual train, it's a digital train, it's a, a broadband train, if they can't see that train coming down the tracks, they're not going to be ready for the economy that's about to emerge for us. The winners in this game, it seems to me, coming out of the graduations, are people who are game literate, who are in fact game ready. The losers are TV ready. They're very much 20th century thinkers. Uh, they're, they're waiting to sit back and allow the economy to come to them. But gamers will tell you, people who play games and engage with this medium understand that it's the doing, it's the engaging, it's the exploring, it's the actual taking control that is going to be the most important uh, driver for their opportunity in the economy. So I've put up some articles just on the screen and it, you won't be able to see them on camera but for example I've got the internet the internet revolution is the new industrial revolution right and I've got uh, the video game challenge the Australian STEM video game challenge the idea that we get 4,000 young people all over Australia Acer's video game challenge uh, participating in designing and developing games because they understand these skills are critical uh, for their careers. Uh, we also have, for example, um, the Games for Change group uh, and their research on learning 
and the opportunity to use games for all sorts of new learning environments. We're in an election cycle here in Australia, as is uh, North America, and of course uh, we're on the eve also of the vote uh, for whether or not uh, the UK stays in or leaves the EU. These are heady times, and many of our politicians are acknowledging that there's a lot of uncertainty in the economy, not least of which is in the area of the future of jobs and the future of industries. Here we have um, our current Prime Minister, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, uh, donning a pair of um, head, or head mounted display for virtual reality that my colleague James Burt who is here with us today and I'll, I'll be talking about um, is researching. These tools are so critical for the future of work it seems to me and people all over the world are already using these tools. So this brings me to something that is just astounding. The Australian government, the Senate, this year, uh, sorry last year uh, introduced an inquiry into the future of Australia's uh, video games development industry. At the same time, overseas, we received a number of announcements about the size of the interactive media industries. Turns out that as of this year, now, video games around the world are worth $100 billion US. So that's what, 125 to 135, depending on the exchange rate, billion dollars Australian. That is an enormous industry. And the most important thing is, that industry isn't just about the old world of, world of consoles and PCs. In fact, for the first time ever, mobile games have overtaken console and PC games as a dominant form of entertainment. So the games industry has had a huge couple of years. That's the entertainment industry. The Senate in Australia has investigated the place of games and games development. And what we know now is that it is a growing, uh, a growing environment for economic uh, development and the future of a number of industries. So I just want to talk about the Senate inquiry for just a minute. If the, if the Australian Senate wants to investigate why Australia isn't performing as well as its competitors in the market on computer and video games, and they're making a number of recommendations that lead them to say that we really need to be pushing this industry, what is that telling us? about what a number of politicians and industry players are saying about Australia's competitiveness. As we enter a downturn, we're really going to need to be digital savvy. And if we're not, I think we're in trouble. Stuart. Has anything, you said this uh, inquiry was last year, has anything uh, come out of it so far? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, the, the first tangible output from the inquiry, which included a uh, number of submissions uh, and then a number of um, uh, testimonies, uh, was a report that was uh, produced in April. It's a fairly large report. It's quite comprehensive. It interviews a very large number of people. And among other things, Stuart, it talks about um, improving a number of the existing initiatives on the digital economy. Uh, including, uh, for example, the e-government initiatives uh, to improve the capacity of government and industry to work together in a digital space. Um, the acknowledgement in the report, and the thing that, and I'm so gr grateful for your question, the thing I want to highlight is that it really talks up serious games, or the serious place of games. One of the major themes in the report is that this industry isn't just about entertainment. It's about the future of knowledge, it's the future of education, it's the future of training, it's the future of engagement, and as, as we'll see, human, uh, coaching humans to improve themselves. And so the second, one of the second major points is, it's a skill set. This industry requires a certain level of capacity, programming capacity, um, art capacity, audience engagement capacity, that ultimately will determine whether or not the workforce in the economy has the ability to actually propel the economy forward in a competitive way against very large players, uh, particularly China and India, which are um, moving by leaps and bounds in this space. China now has the world's first and second fastest computers, uh, and they are producing a very large amount of digital media content. So uh, we're competing against very big and very powerful players. Um, so, uh, as many of you know, I've been uh, very lucky to work with the Interactive Games and Entertainment Association here in Australia, looking at how audiences use games. And our most recent study last year, which was Digital Australia 2016, so we talk about it all this year, uh, is just something I want to turn our attention to. We produce a lot of statistics and a lot of data about Australian audiences in this research. But the most compelling thing for me 
is the fact that when we look at the average age of gamers, it's 33. Uh, the fact that almost half of all people who play games are female. The fact that people who are older play games. Turns out that 49% of people over the age of 50, pick me, play video games. It's pretty impressive. This is not a niche audience anymore. More importantly, when we ask people why they play games these days, their answers vary greatly, and particularly along age lines. So if we, I'll just zoom in here. If we look at people who are age 50 and over, the number one reason they play video games is to keep their minds active. That's a serious function for video games. Because as we know, uh, problems with um, early onset of dementia, uh, problems with cognitive complexity, problems with keeping current in an economy that requires people to continue working uh, longer into their lives will require higher levels of digital skills. And so to keep the mind active is a fantastic purpose for video games, it seems to me. So when we then interrogate the audience further and we ask our participants why um, people might use video games for serious purposes, the number one reason they say for health purposes is to improve their thinking skills. The second reason is to improve coordination. The third reason is to improve dexterity. Then comes emotional well-being, which is quite the opposite of what we might have thought about games 20 years ago. But of course, games are also very social and they allow us a, a high level of connectivity. When we ask people um, how might games be useful for aging, the number one reason they say is to increase, increase mental stimulation. And we hear it time and time again from participants in our study, they're desperate, uh, particularly if they're older, for new ways to stimulate their minds to keep current. Stuart? Do we know anything about um, what kind of games these people are playing to uh, increase mental stimulation? Actually, we sure do. Um, obviously, uh, there are age-related tracks around different genres of games. Uh, First-person shooters may not be at the top of their list. Um, puzzles, um, RPGs are definitely there. Traditional games, uh, including board games. Very social games. One of the most popular ones for those over the age of 80 is Words with Friends. So it's really amazing that these games, which have a high level of variation, suit a wide, le wide range of audiences for their, those audiences' purposes. And I think in terms of keeping the mind active and for mental stimulation, a lot of the puzzle games and the social um, competition games are critical. I think there's a lot of promise in this space. Um, but I want to talk about games breaking out, if I could, just for a minute, and moving just right away from games. Um, we know that a number, of, uh, a number of publications and a number of universities and a number of researchers are looking at how games can be used in education. That's, that's a given. Um, we know also that um, companies are starting to use games to uh, engage emo uh, uh, potential employees for emotional intelligence or their ability to, to um, you know, complete complex tasks. I'm going to talk about Revelian, a, a fantastic Australian company, and give a shout out to our friends at, at Revelian today. Um, uh, doing amazing things and even experimenting now, looking at new areas like emotional intelligence for employees. Um, but I'm also very interested in the use of games uh, breaking out of the game world and into areas like the built environment, right? And something where we start looking at um, architecture, planning and um, environmental design and how games could be used there. It turns out, just this week, how, how propitious is this? The Economist um, magazine had an article, uh, the, um, I've just put an indication of it here, uh, the headline was uh, Engineers of Creation, or Engines of Creation, sorry. And this, this article talks about uh, the Unreal 4 engine and how it's being used by architectural firms, for example, to show clients different variations in real time of different built environments. Video game technology very quickly being turned into tools for a wide range of purposes that they were never originally designed, or at least we think designed, uh, to be used. So a fascinating set of developments. Uh, so let me turn to Revelian. So Revelian is a Brisbane company. They are masters in the global environment, in the global world, of employee testing uh, for checking uh, on employees' abilities to uh, engage in a number of different tasks, make a number of complex decisions, 
um, work under pressure, and as I said before, emotional intelligence. I've got on the screen here, uh, and you can just go on to YouTube if you're interested in this. Um, they've got a number of videos up showing some of their products. They have very big clients, among them banks, uh, retailers, uh, uh, consulting firms, and Revelion builds video games that we might play when we go for a job. The video games collect a lot of data uh, and tell employers about potential employees. Fantastic, right? So we know that games are also connected to the big data economy and are changing the way we understand human behavior. Uh, I'm also very interested in an article that just was published in Wired Magazine, and James, this, I'm sure you've seen this, is very interesting, um, discussions of using uh, tools like Oculus Rift, uh, where employees, uh, sorry, um, uh, players are engaged in moving their body slightly to work with a virtual environment. They've got a head-mounted display on, and the most interesting thing about this article is they're not moving very much. They're only moving just a little bit uh, to make, like, move a disc or move a ball in a, in a play environment. But what happens is their brain starts remapping to what actually is being portrayed in the virtual environment. And they start perceiving that their body is moving a lot more than it actually is. The implication here is that we can perceive and experience environments uh, in a way that allows us to go beyond our own capabilities, or at least our capabilities in the now, uh, so that we can actually test ourselves for what we might be able to do in the future. And this suggests to me that video games, uh, particularly with head-mounted displays, and we know that, uh, for example, um, Sony is coming out with its um, PlayStation 4 environment with the head-mounted display uh, later on this year, there will be some amazing discoveries that will come from that platform. So journalists are starting to write about the place of games in education and in engineering, uh, and we're seeing a lot of articles uh, appearing in the media, uh, like this one from James Crafty, looking at um, games in Australian education. But this is where I want to talk about winners. I think in, given the environment, given that games are a global marketplace of, let's call it $100 billion, uh, and are growing uh, in fact, I predicted a couple of years ago, and um, uh, I want to commend to you a series of reports from PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, who produce the uh, Entertainment and Media Outlook every year for a five-year period, um, and they've, they've used some of these numbers, and they've also talked about the growth of the digital um, games industry. Uh, everyone is predicting uh, that the industry will continue to grow at or about 8 to 10 percent a year, compound annual growth rate, more than any other uh, sector of the media industries. This means, obviously, that there will be opportunities there for employment. Uh, there will also be tremendous changes in what's being done with games. Uh, and as a result, um, what we expect to see is that uh, games will start really being used in new and innovative ways. And I want to suggest to you that games are the future of personal coaching. As we see a big shift in the economy, a lot of jobs are going to go, people are going to need to retool. I think video games will be tools for retooling. And so what I want to suggest to you is, um, of course, coaching provides very personal, um, very individual-oriented engagement. Um, it helps us improve our abilities if we have a good coach, but I don't think there are enough coaches out there for the number of people who are going to need to be retrained. And so we're going to need some automated tools. So um, you know, if, if games can individuate the delivery of um, a personal journey, and I love games where I can explore, uh, then, uh, and they allow me to make mistakes and learn through those mistakes without fear of um, a more serious consequence, <laughs> then I think that's a great, um, a great environment. If they can monitor my progress, if they can give me real-time feedback, um, if they can tolerate and iterate around my resistance because maybe I don't feel up to it, and here I'm just channeling my um, adolescent years and uh, my resistance to algebra, um, you know, if, if, if a game could say, hey, Jeff, here's a fun way to do it because I know you and I know that you're really into cars, so let's do, let's do algebra and cars. I'll say, okay, I'm listening. At least you've crossed a hurdle, right? So, um, and of course, if games actually can do things dynamically and not in a flat sort of fixed environment that's supposed to fit everyone but can fit me and allow me to explore, then I'm probably going to get a lot more out of games. 
uh, and those sorts of coaches. And so here on the screen, I'm just um, this is uh, this is a paper from researchers at Tufts, uh, and this is a effectively a digital butler um, and coach who helps um, visitors to a. Um, uh, it's basically a um, museum of science in Boston. So I think the next big thing, of course, uh, is taking games in the 2D, 3D screen environment and placing them into simple robots. Um, it's not out of uh, the question. In fact, the earliest Discovery Channel you know, videos on the future of robots is over a decade ago now. Uh, and we know that robotics have, has changed quite a lot. I think what we're going to see um, and here we have National Geographic has sort of a challenge robots programming environment. Uh, we're being conditioned for a robotics coaching game environment. And I think the real winners uh, in this world will be people who are willing to engage uh, with these tools. Down on the right hand corner, um, I've got uh, Stefan Siebert, who's a, who's a chap from Stuttgart University, who is teaching a, a NOW robot. We have NOW robots here at um, Bond University, and we're using them right now uh, in our classes, uh, particularly around um, with, with children who are on the autism spectrum disorder. Here, uh, Siebert is actually teaching the NOW robot to play go uh, a card game in real space. Imagine if you could get the NOW robot to help you with a complex puzzle task or a maths task or a science experiment right at your desk in your home. I think that's going to happen, and I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, so who will the people be who will win and, and work with, um, let's call them game bots, for lack of a better term, uh, for the moment? I think if, if you have a high level of computer literacy right now, you'll succeed. No problem. If you have a high level of uh, game computer literacy, great. If you have social literacy, critical, because of course you're going to have to be able to work with people and machines who have a kind of social intelligence. And importantly, if you have machine literacy, and that is knowing how to work with complex devices in your home that are more complicated than a television or a toaster. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, and that's an illusion for those of you who are into Battlestar Galactica uh, and robots and toasters, but we'll leave that one. When you say uh, game literacy, you mm. mean, uh, basically a familiarity with uh, uh, video games in general, or...? Um... Uh, I'm saying, thanks for that, Stuart. I'm saying uh, game literacy is understanding uh, strategies around games, understanding uh, different kinds of genres, understanding what you do in the genres, understanding that a lot of games have tutorial sessions, or look, let's call them coaches, right. uh, and they on-ramp you anyway, so you shouldn't be afraid of them. Uh, I've often said that people who say, oh, I don't have time to play games, uh, really are simply not literate. They're, all they're saying is, I just don't have game literacy. What sort of role do you think uh, channels like National Geographic and the, the STEM video game challenge have in teaching people about game literacy? Well, I think that's a really good question, Alad. And I think, uh, the, in the first instance, all of these uh, media channels have done, I think they've been champions of the place of technology in a socio-cultural environment, so connecting up the op and looking at ways to optimize the relationship between people and, and, their, and our tools. After all, let's just step back for a second. Uh, they will remind us, and National Geographic certainly would remind us, that if we strip away all our tools, we, this, everything that we see in this room is a contrivance except for our bodies, ourselves. Right? And a lot of us shouldn't be here because of our tools. Uh, uh, you know, they've allowed um, you know, the birth rate to be successful when many of us probably would have had co otherwise complicated births. So even many of us wouldn't be here. So uh, I think the socio-technical system in which we exist, I think these channels would say, and these, these, um, these, uh, these media sources would have helped us understand, are very much a part of who we are and what our future is. So my view is they've groomed us and helped us understand uh, that we should have a healthy uh, fear of technology. But that fear doesn't mean burying our heads in the sand, rather it means engaging and understanding right now. That's the most important thing that we can do, is engage and understand with the tools that are available to us. Um, so, um, oh, I was just going to say too, uh, you know, CETA, so this is the Committee on the Economic Development of Australia, also the World Economic Forum have over the past 12 months both published very similar reports on the future of employment. They're saying there's a very high probability that 40% of all jobs that exist today will be gone. So retraining using some sort of interactive, compelling, engaging tool to coach us through this transition 
will be critical. And I think that there is blue sky in developing businesses around this space. I really do. Um, it's not possible to see it on the screen here, but in the World Economic Forum report, one of the things that the report points out is that we are going to need a very high level of cross-functional skills. And among those skills are our abilities to work with people in complex and different environments, to work uh, in programming environments, programming logic environments, something that James Burt talks a lot about, um, and our ability to uh, learn skills throughout our lives and retool constantly. So all of us are, I think in this environment, certainly at Bond University, understand that we constantly need to up upgrade our skills. James. Jeff, I believe also in that report it talks a lot about creativity. Oh, thank you. Exploration and play. Good on you. I, so, so creativity, exploration, exploration and play are repeated in these reports. And I actually have highlighted, so thank you very much for reminding me, uh, in sections of the report, the one, the one skill set that, at least in the foreseeable future, we don't think artificial intelligence can uh, challenge us greatly in is creative process. And so creative process is about, uh, not, not just about, you know, we're not, not talking about design and drawing. We're talking about engaging with one another, learning in the, the life that it presents itself to us now, and engaging with our students, our friends, our colleagues, our peers, and people we haven't met to solve our problems. Creative problem solving is not an individual exercise, it's a creative social exercise. I'm so glad you raised that because I, I was going to skip that point and it's critical. Um, so um, I guess I'll wrap up because we've only got a couple minutes left and there, there may be a couple more questions. I just want to point out that right now here at Bond University we have an amazing community of people working in this space and so I invite everyone watching and thanks again for um, coming in from Periscope across uh, the Twitter sphere uh, or the Twitterverse and um, thank you also everyone for attending but uh, I work with uh, colleagues like James Burt who's doing research on virtual reality and health education and training, uh, make, basically making people safer uh, in, uh, in health environments. Uh, Penny DeBell, who is the author of the world's leading textbook on Unity 3D, a holistic um, game design approach. Uh, I work with Scott Knight, who is finishing his thesis on film to game adaptation. Uh, we have um, Jacob Machewski, who's doing open world role playing games and intangible cultural heritage. I mean, really interesting projects. And I don't know if you've noticed, but none of them have anything to do with Bioshock or, you know, uh, or, or Minecraft, although that, that's, my, that's my territory. Um, Stuart Todd Under, who's here, has just completed his master's thesis on um, using um, audio feedback in books to overcome or compensate for the haptic or the touch um, attachment that we develop to real world books. Uh, and I'll just, just in case you guys are watching, and you probably are, um, I just want to shout out to all of our graduates who are working now at Deloitte Digital, uh, Saxon, uh, Paul, Taylor, hi guys, uh, you make us proud, and um, also Simon Cameron uh, over just nearby at the Binary Mill, and uh, over in the Pacific Northwest, uh, three amazing women, uh, Jamie, Amy, and Danielle, hi if you're watching. Uh, we miss you here at Bond University. So look, I, all I wanted to do was just provoke some thinking about the future of games and say that it's more serious than we think. Uh, and if we don't take it seriously now, uh, then we're not going to be very competitive in the future. So uh, any, any final questions? How are we going for time? Do we have anything off the, uh, the Twitterverse? All right. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It forced me to think about some things that I probably need to give a lot of more attention to. Yeah. Okay, good. Yay!